thing yesterday uh, like, like during the last session we saw what are the principles of uh, stenting what are the various types of stent and uh, we briefly dealt with stenting of aorta so today we'll go into pulmonary arteries and the other areas about pulmonary artery stenosis we need to know how common is pulmonary artery stenosis about 3% of all congenital heart disease have pulmonary artery stenosis the, the reason why we want to know about it is for example last time we saw coarctation coarctation contributes to about 5% of all congenital heart disease similarly pa stenosis contributes to about 3% of all congenital heart diseases it will be isolated pa stenosis alone in about one third of the patients and associated with other forms of congenital heart disease in about two thirds of the patients the classification of uh, pulmonary artery stenosis is based on radiology there is type 1 stenosis which means involving only one blood vessel type 1 can either be a which is main pulmonary artery or b which is right pulmonary artery or c which is left pulmonary artery and then you can sub classify them as discrete short segment stenosis or long tubular stenosis so this is a main pulmonary artery discrete short segment stenosis uh, sorry this is a membranous stenosis and this is a little longer stenosis then comes type 2 type 2 is bifurcation stenosis that means stenosis that are involving the distal mpa proximal rpa and proximal lpa so which can be reasonably be like short segment a or long diffuse b then there is multiple peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis so this involves only the peripheral pulmonary artery that means the hyla the mediastinal portions are normal and the post hilar portions are alone narrow and then we have type 4 which is a combination of both central and peripheral example this is a post arterial switch discrete main pulmonary artery stenosis at the level of supravalvular arrhythmia so this will be called as type 1 because it is only one level 1a because it is main pulmonary artery etiology for this is post arterial switch mpa stenosis this is a patient with noonan syndrome where there is a tethering sorry there is a tethering of the pulmonary valve to the supravalvular sinotubular junction so this is also a discrete stenosis at the sinotubular junction so again another example of type 1a but involving only the main pulmonary artery discrete left pulmonary artery stenosis due to ductal site insertion and this is 1c because c means left pulmonary artery b means right pulmonary artery we'll see an example of b see put it on silent mode so 1b this is rps stenosis only right is narrow now what is the reason for this right being narrow this was a a, a patient for whom a hemitruncus surgery was there and the right pulmonary artery was honest most back into the main pulmonary artery and in that area there is a narrow now you can also observe that there is one technique that has been followed for this particular angiogram when we are injecting into the main pulmonary artery blood will go into the larger left pulmonary artery far more than the smaller right pulmonary artery and so this is what is called as the balloon occlusion dermal angiogram so you go and inflate the balloon so that you are selectively trying to fill the right pulmonary artery better so these are all examples of type 1 type 2 is bifurcation stenosis and if it is very very localized then if it is very very localized then it is called uh, 2a and if it is diffuse you see this is also a bifurcation stenosis but extending all the way up to the entire hilar vein so this long segment bifurcation stenosis is type 2b then comes 3 3 means central portions of the pa is all normal which only the peripheral pas are narrow you see that the entire central pulmonary artery is normal but the peripheral pulmonary arteries are all the intra hilar parenchymal pas are narrow and type 4 is a combination so this is an example of a syndromic child who is having 
a narrow main pulmonary artery, narrow right and left pulmonary artery, and intrahilar pulmonary artery also, there are various levels of stenosis. So, this is type 4. So, just a recap, 1 means single level stenosis, 2 means bifurcation stenosis, 3 means multiple peripheral stenosis, and 4 means central plus peripheral stenosis. How will you describe a PA stenosis? You will say, tell where is the location. Is it main pulmonary artery, RPA or LPA? And whether it is prehilar or post -hilar. You will tell whether it is discrete or diffuse. You will tell whether it is single level or multiple. You will tell whether there is post traumatic dilatation or no post traumatic dilatation. You will tell whether there is an associated lung hypoplasia or no lung hypoplasia. And then finally you will tell that what is the gradient. So let us talk about all these issues. Post traumatic dilatation, this is an example of an RPS stenosis, the post traumatic dilatation. Whereas this is no post traumatic dilatation at all. If you use narrowing, there is no post traumatic. So, you need to mention whether there is a post traumatic dilatation or not. What is the embryological basis of this pulmonary artery stenosis? The pulmonary artery at the level of sinuses are formed from bulbous cardiac. So, this is the type of abnormality that you will find in tetralogy of fallow, double outlet right entity, and all that that can be stenosis. The main pulmonary artery arises from the truncus with the formation of the spiral septum. So, this is where you will get the truncus arteriosus with the FPS stenosis, truncus arteriosus with branch PS stenosis. Then the proximal right and left pulmonary artery will come from the sixth aortic arch. Here you will get the isolated PS stenosis on one or the other side. And then the distal pulmonary arteries come from the lung mesenchyme. So, these are the conditions that will be associated with connective tissue abnormalities like cutis laxa. So, the, the, the embryologically, the various parts of the pulmonary artery keep on coming from different, different portions on embryos. Now, coming to what causes the PA stenosis, it can be prenatal influence or steratogens, genetic, developmental or ductal constriction. I'll come into all these things. Now, what is prenatal? The various syndromes that are associated can have rubella syndrome, a steratogen, genetic syndromes, allergic syndrome, Noonan syndrome, Williams, cutis laxa, Erler Danlas, arterial tilt, arthrosity, silver razzle, then developmental abnormality associated with TOF or DORVs. And then ductal closure. Whenever the duct stenosis at the origin of the left pulmonary artery, you can have stenosis. This is what is called as a developmental variation. So this is an example of the patient who is having a diffuse long segment RPA stenosis. Yes, focal LPA origin stenosis. Both of them have been stented. So it is also written here allergic syndrome. How do you know that it's allergic syndrome? If you carefully see, there's a butterfly vertebra here. You see here also there is a butterfly vertebra. See here, that is this, that two, sorry. So those two are actually, you see, there's a separation here. So this is a patient with allergic syndrome. This is an example of a Noonan syndrome with diffuse RPA hypoplasia, LPA hypoplasia. So the various, various causes can be there. This is an example of an arterial tortuosity syndrome and the patient had a tortuous narrowed pulmonary artery. So this is the and the patient also had an associated atrial septal defect which was subsequently closed with the device because the RPA and LPA narrowing were not of major hemodynamic significance. Developmental abnormality, this is what is called as a malposed pulmonary artery or crossed pulmonary artery. Crossed pulmonary artery means left pulmonary artery arises from the rightward wall of the main pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery arises from the leftward wall of the pulmonary artery. You can see that better on a, on a CT reconstruction. This is a volume rendered CT. You see here, this is the main pulmonary artery trunk. The LPA is arising from the rightward wall and the right pulmonary artery will arise from the leftward wall. So this crossing over is what is called crossed pulmonary artery. And this is, this is how the crossed pulmonary artery will look on an angiography. So these pulmonary arteries are prone for stenosis. They are extremely prone for stenosis. Pulmonary artery slings are prone for stenosis. This is a right pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery is arising from the middle of the right pulmonary artery, hooks around the trachea, courses posterior to the trachea, and then goes into the left lung. The place where it is hooked, it can be narrowed. And this is, these are various reasons. This is ductal site stenosis of discrete left pulmonary artery narrowing. You can see the discrete left pulmonary artery narrowing. This is due to duct ductal constriction. The most important cause of pulmonary artery stenosis is iatrogenic. Hydrogenic is caused by stretch of the pulmonary artery, kink of the pulmonary artery, pull, extrinsic compression, twist, scar fibrosis. We'll see what is all these things. Kink. The neonate gets a BT shunt and you put a, you put a shunt from the left subclavian artery into the left pulmonary artery. The shunt is small 
the child continues to grow so it gets kink and the kinking causes narrowing and there is no further perfusion of the left lung so this leads to gross left lung hypoperfusion twist what is a twist ascending aorta rp arises from the ascending aorta from an abnormal angulation the surgeon disconnects this pulmonary artery here and anastomoses it to this main pulmonary artery but geometrically we will not be knowing whether we are twist twisting it or not and so if there is a twisting the twisted area will not grow and so that will result in rpn error extrinsic compression this is a patient with post norwood stage 2 you can see that the diffusely the left pulmonary artery is narrow the reason for that left pulmonary artery narrowing is because it is caused by the dilated anterior ascending aorta which is formed by the main pulmonary artery to ascending aorta anastomosis and posteriorly the descending thoracic aorta so this is in the aortic wise this left pulmonary artery is narrowed and that has been relieved by this lpa stenting so it can be an extrinsic compression it can be due to stretch i told about the left pulmonary artery which is in a lpa sling it is stretched around the trachea and so in this area there will be a gradient and another example of a stretch is a post lecompt rpa and lpa diffuse hypoplasia caused by post arterial switch operation you can appreciate that when the pulmonary arteries are sorry so when the pulmonary arteries are so this is the post lecompt pulmonary artery both of them have been stretched over the posterior ascending aorta and so that causes diffuse narrowing the mechanism of narrowing this is a pull the shunt that has been given to the upper lobe pulls and cuts off this upper lobe branch so varieties of mechanism and these are important to understand because certain for example if it is only an a, a kink of the vessel and if you try to put in a pulmonary artery stent they are more prone for malposition and embolization so it is important to understand what is the mechanism the reason for the pulmonary artery stent what is the reason why we we take so much of importance to pulmonary artery stenosis pulmonary artery stenosis decides the lung growth if suppose there is a tight pulmonary artery stenosis and leave the patient for many years without correcting it uh, thinking that the child is asymptomatic and so just to try to if even one lung perfusion is enough these children do not grow their left lung at all so finally you will see that this is hardly any flow and even after you do a successful stenting after the stent Still, the arborization is very poor, so it's very important that all these patients should be intervened before the lung growth is completed. How do you evaluate a PA stenosis? By echocardiogram, will give you initial clues, but echocardiogram has that lots of fallacies, and CT scan or MR imaging by some that is three-dimensional imaging is very important. Perfusion scan can be done only if there is unilateral PA stenosis and if there is no right left shunt. If there is a right left shunt, if you inject macro aggregated albumin, this macro aggregated albumin will go preferentially towards the brain and the liver and various other organs, and so you will not be able to get adequate scan data. And a large amount of macro aggregated albumin going into the brain may also cause cerebral hypoperfusion. So it's not an advisable thing to inject uh, technetium labeled macro aggregated albumin lung perfusion scan in a patient who is having right left shunt. since congenital heart disease associated ps stenosis are very often associated with right left shunt we need to carefully assess which patient is suitable for perfusion scan then hemodynamics and angiography echo we have to remember that there will be lot of fallacies this was a patient who was picked up to have a discrete lpa origin narrowing on the echocardiogram however there was no narrowing of the rpa that was noted however when we did an echocardiogram uh, angiogram we understood that the proximal portion of the rpa is very very roomy but the mediastinal portion of the rpa was significantly narrowed and this was completely missed out on the uh, uh, echocardiogram so echocardiogram sometimes may completely miss second thing unilateral ps stenosis the gradient may be very low and so we need to understand just because the the unilateral ps stenosis with a gradient of 16 mm 20 mm so thinking that they are acceptable is not a correct option sometimes they may be severely be narrow and you will be thinking that since the gradient is not high we need not the body will try to adjust all the pulmonary blood flow into one lung and thereby will not increase the gradient at all then there is also people talk about diastolic tailing diastolic tailing is an important feature while that is true in coaptation it's not true in ps stenosis 
PS genesis, it may be present or may not be present. Do you know why? I'll show an example. This is the distal pulmonary artery pressure. The distal pulmonary artery pressure is very, very low pulse pressure. It's hardly about only 4 millimeters of mercury is the pulse pressure. Lot of respiratory variation and the mean pressure is somewhere around 12. Now you pull back the catheter into the proximal pulmonary artery. This is the systolic pressure which goes up to 40 and the diastolic pressure goes to 5 to 6. This is what is called ventricularization of the pulmonary artery pressure. <coughs> Peripheral pulmonary stenosis produces ventricularization. The reason why the proximal pulmonary artery pressures in diastole goes to very, very, very low levels is because proximal pulmonary arteries are extremely compliant elastic vessels. So they will relax sufficiently and allow the PA diastolic to fall to very low levels. While in coaptation you will have diastolic hypertension of the upper, like the above the narrowing. In pulmonary artery stenosis you will not have diastolic hypertension. So if there is no diastolic hypertension, how will you expect the diastolic trailing of the gradient? So there can be patients where there will not be any diastolic trailing at all. So don't go by diastolic trailing as one of the indicator. Now I am just showing one hemodynamics of a PA stenosis. You see that the reason this is the distal RPA pressure which is very low. It is just about 25 millimeters of mercury systolic with about 10 millimeters diastolic. The moment you pull back from the stenosis, the proximal RPA pressure, this is what is called ventricularization. You can see that the PA diastolic pressures are very, very, very low, but the proximal PA pressure is very high. So if the proximal RPA pressure is so high and the distal RPA pressure is so low, it goes even up to 130. That means this is bilateral peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. Unilateral peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis will not produce elevation of the RV systolic pressure and proximal PA pressure. So the features of pul pulmonary artery stenosis and hemodynamics is ventricularization of PA pressure and the RV systolic pressure increases if there is bilateral PA stenosis. But if there is unilateral PA stenosis, there won't be any significant gradient. And to take it to an extreme, in Glenn circuits and Fontan circuits, even 1 to 2 millimeters of mercury gradient is extremely significant. So we talked about what is overestimation and underestimation of echocardiography. In the presence of bilateral pulmonary artery stenosis, which are involving long segments of the pulmonary artery, the gradient will be very high and the stenosis will be overestimated by echocardiography because pulmonary artery is a tubular structure, so you will falsely get a very high gradient. You will get a gradient of 90, 100 and all, but when you put in catheter, you will find only 50 or 60. So, in patients with bilateral peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis, don't go by stenosis gradient, go by RV systolic pressure by TRZ or RV systolic contractility. So, some other use some other indicators and don't go by the gradient. So, like don't make decisions about interventions or surgery based on PA stenosis gradients in bilateral PA stenosis. In unilateral stenosis, redistribution of lung vascularity to the non-obstructed side leads to very low gradients only. So, in, if there is a unilateral stenosis and if you are getting very low gradients, don't ignore them. That is also significant. I am telling in bilateral pulmonary artery stenosis, don't always there will be overestimation. And in unilateral PA stenosis, there will be underestimation. In Glenn and Fontan pathway, there won't be any gradient at all detected by echocardiography because it will be hardly 1 to 2 millimeters of mercury. CT angiogram is a very valuable tool. However, we need to remember that the, ch the child will get double radiation. If you are going to do a CT angiogram and subsequently put the patient for a PA stenting procedure, the patient gets too much of radiation. It's always a fascination. Even everybody says MRI is very good, but we need to understand post-operative patients will have a lot of sternal wires, facing wire ends, clips, coils, devices, lot of ferromagnetic inter interference will be there. Nowadays, since many of the pacing wires are just cut and left behind in the chest because pulling the pacing wire may lead to hemothorax because it may avulse certain portions of the atria and ventricle. So it is becoming a routine practice to leave behind all pacing wires inside, many clips inside. So your MR imaging, even though it may look very attractive, saying that you know you don't have any radiation at all, in many practical patients it may not be very useful. Lung perfusion scan useful only in unilateral stenosis. If there is bilateral stenosis, there is no utility because you will not be able to differentiate between what is the right and left perfusion. If lungs are very, very hypoplastic due to chronic PA stenosis, there won't be a major increase in ratio after intervention. And if there is a significant right to left shunt, you should not do a lung perfusion scan because many of the macroaggregate algorithms will go into the brain. 
What are the common angiographic views that you do for the stenting? RPA is better seen in an AP projection or a shallow RAO projection. And LPA is seen in a steep LOR lateral. This is an LPA angio which is shown in a very, very, very steep LOR lateral. Because on an AP projection, the main pulmonary and the LPA will overlap. So you have to give a lot of LOR lateral to get this LPA origin. Whenever there is a bifurcation stenosis, you have to go either AP caudal or LAO caudal. This is an example of a LAO caudal. You can see the bifurcation far more clearly. Bilateral origin of RPA and LPA can also be seen by LAO cranial. So this is a dilated main pulmonary. This is the right and the left. So LAO cranial also will give the origins of the two pulmonary arteries. However, if there is a markedly dilated main pulmonary artery or right ventricular outflow tract, then it might mask. In all the Glenn patients, just to do plain AP view. So these are the angiographic views that we will be choosing. Rarely, you may do a pulmonary vein wedge angiography to identify the distal VA. Here, this is a patient who is having an RVOT injection. It fills the RVOT main pulmonary artery and goes into the right, but no left filling is seen. Then you do a transeptal puncture, go into the left lung and make a wedge angiogram. You are able to appreciate the hilar left lung artery with the complete stenosis of the LPA discrete origin. We also have to understand that there are certain fallacies on angiography. The patient had bilateral pulmonary artery stenosis on echocardiography, but when you did an angiogram, you see that the right pulmonary artery is completely wide open. Actually, this right pulmonary artery had a gradient of 50 millimeters of mercury on echocardiography. What is the reason? We have to understand that this right pulmonary artery is actually behind this ascending aorta. So if this ascending aorta is compressing this right pulmonary artery anteroposteriorly, you will have a normal dimension on the AP plane. However, when you repeat a steep caudal, you can identify here that there is a tight narrowing caused by this aortic compression. You see, the, you see this is the region of narrowing and the whole of the aorta is sitting on the top. So if, if you freeze this, this is the area of the iota and the iota is actually pressing the origin of the right pulmonary artery and so this is an example of extrinsic compression of the right pulmonary artery by the dilated ascending iota and so unless you do a very steep caudal you will be missing out all this narrowing. 3D rotational angiography is another very very valuable tool and after you do the 3D rotational angiography you can rotate it vertically, horizontally in various planes and you will be able to appreciate where, where is the levels of the narrowing. Now, what are the options available for pulmonary artery stenosis? We can do a pericardial patch plasty or a homograft patch because pericardium shrinks a lot, pericardium fibrosis a lot. So people now, some people say that we can use homograft patch. But the problem about homograft is it calcifies and it closes up. That is also not a great patch. But homograft patch can be used, PTFE patch can be used. But there is a very high chance of restenosis calcification and occlusion. Balloon dilatation can be done, but balloon dilatation leads to immediate recoil and restenosis. High pressure balloon angioplasty is one option where you can create a lot of tear in the vessel and try to gain luminal diameter. However, it has not been shown to be consistently be useful. Cutting balloon angioplasty is possible, but there are limitations of the, its availability. And the blade, cutting balloon, is, is, is called flex stone. It's a, it's a balloon with four blades that are attached to the four corners of the balloon and the blade may get owls from the balloon and so if this is a problem and cutting balloons are only available up to 8 millimeters so if you want to further and further dilate it is not possible. Stenting is the most reliable method of relieving a pulmonary stenosis but we should remember that the stenting should be permissive for the growth of the pulmonary artery. You cannot go and put a stent of 6 mm, 7 mm in a, in a small child and if that stent cannot be further dilated, it is extremely bad for the child. So we need to remember. Stenting, the steps involved are initial angiography, initial evaluation with echocardiography, angiography. We have to choose the sheep, guide wire, balloon and stent. Advisable to always have the sheep across the lesion. That means you cross the lesion with the sheep and take the balloon stent through the sheep. Stiff guide wires are always preferred. Soft guide wires will not allow you to take the balloon stent easily. Sometimes you may have to choose very, very stiff guide wires like Lunderquist guide wire, Backup Mayer guide wire, Amplans ultra stiff guide wire. 
balloon should have burst pressures more than 6 to 8 millimeter. You should not use soft balloons like TISAC 2 balloon, TISAC balloons and all, which have got burst pressures of 1 to 2 atmospheres. You should have balloons which are at least 6 to 8 millimeters, 6 to 8 atmospheres. Stent should be post dilatable for growth of the child. Pre-mounted stents are very easy to use. They don't lead to stent slippage, but many of the pre-mounted stents are not post dilatable. If a pre-mounted stent of 10 mm visipro, you cannot dilate more than 10 mm. So you are stuck with 10 mm for the rest of your life. But when sheets cannot cross, sometimes front loading technique can be used. I'll just show some example. This is a patient who is having bilateral pulmonary artery stenosis. So you can appreciate the LPA origin is narrowed here and the entire mediastinal portion of the RPA is narrowed here. So what do you do? You take bilateral venous axis. You get some clear angiography about where is the location of the stenosis. So LPA origin, LPA stenosis is confined to the origin and the RPA stenosis is along its entire length. Then you, after you make the measurements, then you go for passing two stiff guide wires and two sheets across. And through the sheet, you take the balloon stent assembly. So this is a balloon stent assembly that has been taken through the sheet. And now the sheet has been partially been withdrawn. Check the position of the stent and then deploy the stent. So left side is done. And when you are deploying the left side, the right, there is a stable wire sheet assembly. Then you expose the right stent, withdraw the sheet, make angiography, and so slowly start inflating the right balloon at the exact position. So now both are dilated. Then you do the check angiography. And your final position, final catheters are, are all fine. Then you come out. So this is basically, in short, how your PA stenting is performed. What is front loading technique? Sometimes the sheet will not cross. If in that case, you take this balloon, load the stent, and use the balloon tip as the dilator for the sheet. You see here, now this is the balloon. The balloon tip is actually acting as the dilator for the sheet tip. And then you push the stent, you push the, uh, the stent across the narrow end. This round structure is actually a Hancock conduit. Hancock conduit is a Dacron conduit with a valve inside, with a with the animal tissue valve inside. How will you choose the stent? Bare stents which are post dilatable are always preferred. There are certain very, very rigid stents like Parma stent from Cardis, Intra stent Max from EV3, Andra XXL from Andra, long CP stents. These are to be used only in main pulmonary artery or conduits. For right left pulmonary artery, you may have to use some flexible stents. Genesis XD from Cardis, Intra Stent Mega from EV3, Andra XL. That is XXL, this is XL. XL from uh, Andra, sharp CP stents. These are for the branch pulmonary artery. Pre mounted post dilatable stents are, that means pre mounted stents, that stent will come with a balloon. But they can be post dilated or the Cook formula stent or Bard value stent. Bard is also now taken over by Edward and so it's called Edward value stent. There are certain pre mounted non dilatable stents which are freely available everywhere. You will go and pick up all these stents in the cat lab, every hospital. There are pre mounted Genesis stents, Express LD from Boston Scientific, EV3 Visipro, Abbott Optilink. These stents can never be post dilated. So if you are putting in an 8 millimeter, 9 millimeter stent, you will never be able to dilate. And these children are stuck for their life. The reason why these are kept in the cat labs are for some iliac interventions, subclavian interventions and all. But unfortunately, that is very often being picked up by, picked up for congenital heart diseases, especially pulmonary arteries, where it will, it will fix the pulmonary arteries only to that size. What are the complications? Whenever they are asking about complications, in your, in your answer sheet, you should write complications can be specific to pulmonary artery stent, complications that can be non-specific. Non-specific is vascular trauma. You can, like, you know, you go read over terminal hematoma, cardiac trauma. You put in catheters and you try tear the vessels and produce tamponade. So these are, these are non-specific. This can happen to anybody. Air embolism, thromboembolism, dislodging the previous pacing wires, 
and arrhythmias, hemodynamic adverse events, endotracheal tube injury, these are these are all non-specific. Specific are stent getting malposed, stent migration, side vessel jailing, dissection of pulmonary artery, intimal flap of the pulmonary artery, completely obstructing the branches of the pulmonary artery, vessel rupture, hemoptysis, hemoptysis caused by guide wire perforation. Ipsilateral lung hyperperfusion edema due to sudden hyperperfusion, thrombosis of the pulmonary artery, stent fractures, <coughs> aneurysms of the pulmonary artery, and progressive instant tissue restenosis. So these are the various complications. Adverse effect can be classified in severity form as level 5 to level 0. Level 0 means no complications. Level 1 means extremely minor complication, which means Transient bradycardia just for about 5 seconds and then it tracks over. Transient hypotension tracks over. When you cross the right ventricle, you produce 4 ectopics, that is a level 1 side effect. Then it goes up. So, level 1 side effect is not of any significance at all and we won't even be bothering about it. Level 2, slightly more. The patient is having some hypotension, you have to give a little bit of fluids. The patient is having some slight bradycardia, you have to give a little bit of atrophy. Level 3 are serious. Level 3 will be something like, sorry, level 3 will be like high branch jailing, high hypotension, hypoxia, STT changes, access site problems, airway problems, allergy, renal injury, neurological. These problems, unless you take definitive measures, these can progress on to serious side effect. Level 4 problems, if these are very serious problems that can lead on to death unless you take immediate care, vascular tear, stent embolization, stent malposition, endotracheal bleeding, reperfusion injury, asystole, level 5 is impending death or impending emergent surgery. So this is how adverse effect is classified in a PA stenosis, level 0 to level 5. Adverse effects are in general more common when you stent distal and distal pulmonary arteries and more safer when you are stenting the proximal pulmonary arteries. So they are more in the low bar and sub low bar location. You see here, this is this is the intra hilar pulmonary artery is being stented. This is the intra hilar pulmonary artery. So these are more common to have side effects. Whereas the proximal LP origin stenosis is less of side effects. It's more with more than two to three stents. See here, you can see one, two, three, three stents. They are more common in this subset. More common in bifurcation stenosis. More common in calcified condition. More common in younger age group. Stent thrombosis, this is a patient who had a bidirectional glension and after the glension there is a complete occlusion of the left pulmonary artery because the left pulmonary artery was pericardial patch was done and yeah, yeah guide wire was passed in, dilated initially, it was diffusely stenosed and so it was stented. After the stenting, it is, the stenting was done but then it's completely getting thrombosed. This is acute stent thrombosis. Then you give thrombolysis and the whole of the clot disappears now and it results in reperfusion of the left one. So here the, the flow. So this is an example of what is called stent thrombosis. I'm not going to show all the all the complications because then it will get too delayed. There are some stenosis which are very resistant stenosis. So this is a patient with bilateral, very diffuse severe hypoplasia and you are trying to dilate with very large stents and you can appreciate that there is some residual lesions. This, this will happen whenever there is an extremely tight stenosis because all the stenosis will not allow a very large stent to be placed. What is the long term after pulmonary artery stenting? Jailing of flow to branch pulmonary artery is seen in almost 49% of the patients in distally placed stents. Whenever you are placing a stent beyond the hilum of the blood vessel, 50% of them will have some form of jailing of flows to some branches. Re-interventions will be needed in almost 50% of the patients. Additional stents may be needed in 20% and additional balloon dilatations may be needed in 30% because we are intervening in small and small children. If we don't intervene on a child less than 6 years, the pulmonary artery will not grow. The lungs will not grow. So you have to intervene. And if you are intervening at 1 year, 2 year and 3 year, you cannot dilate it to adults. So automatically you will be stenting only to 8 millimeter to 10 millimeter. So these stents will invariably need a post dilatation, either with additional stents or with balloon dilatation. So re-interventions are almost seen in up to 50% of the patients. 
During the surgery, whenever the surgeons do the repeat surgery, one third of the stents they will try to remove the stent to do something, but two third of the times they will not touch the stent because the stent will be doing far more good than the surgical work. Who will need re-intervention? In general, any person who is younger in age, any stent that has been put less than 10 million years old, most of the tetralogy's truncus will need some form of re-intervention. The freedom from re-intervention will be two third at two years, at 50 percent at about five years of age, and 40 percent at 10 years of age. That is because in younger and younger child, when you are putting in a stent, it's very obvious that you may have to go in and re-dilate when you have Coming to the next level, conduit stenting. Conduit stenosis is the most common reason for a redo surgery after a conduit replacement. And stenting will relieve the obstruction and so postpone the conduit change. It's a very valuable intervention. This is an example of a diffuse conduit narrowing. This is a, a valve, a, a contagra valve, a contagra valve which is completely getting fibrosed within two years of the procedure and is being stented into a very large 18 millimeter stent. So completely relieving the entire obstruction. So if you have to re-intervene in this patient for a conduit change within two years of the first surgery, how many times you will be re-putting again and again next next to contagra? So you will be ending up in putting 10 to 15 surgeries in this patient's lifetime. So conduit stenting is a very, very valuable intervention. It basically, it tries to postpone the next replacement. Calcified conduits may pose problems in sheet placement and stain placement. However, calcification of the conduit is not a contraindication. If you are having a complete circumferential conduit calcification, don't dilate and stent beyond the original diameter. So dilate only up to its original diameter. If you over dilate, it may rupture. And if you are over dilating, sometimes you may have to use a covered stent. Obstruction is often relieved, but free pulmonary regurgitation occurs. And in these patients, we may have to electively plan a percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation for the free pulmonary regurgitation, like melody valve implantation. Now, coming from pulmonary artery stenting to atrial septal stenting, when will you do it? Why will you do it? And how will you do it? Main three reasons for atrial septal stenting will be when we want to produce a better intracirculatory mixing between the atria. Patients with transposition physiology, either TGA or toxic pain, you want to mix the blood from the RA to LA and LA to RA. So that is reason one. Reason two, to relieve the left side of the left side of pressures. If you have a univentricular heart like hypoplastic left heart syndrome or congenital mitral stenosis or a post shunt with congenital mitral stenosis, in these patients, you want to relieve the left atrial pressure. You may have to put in a stent. <laughs> diastolic heart failure. A grown-up patient with diastolic heart failure or heart failure with normal ejection fraction, they will be in reasons for putting some stenting in the atrial septum. If you are doing an ECMO in a patient for severe left ventricular failure or if the patient is having a severe MR, imagine a viral myocarditis with severe left ventricular failure and severe florid MR, you put on ECMO, you will be able to maintain the systemic circulation, but the continued MR will produce continued lung injury. So you have to decompress the left atrium. So you may have to put in an atrial stent. For Promoting right to left flows, like example, restrictive PFO in tricuspid atresia, TAPVC, or critical RVOT obstruction, and patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension to improve the cardiac output. So this is right to left shunting. This is left to right shunting. This is bidirectional shunting. These are the three groups of indications for creating intracirculatory mixing, intra-atrial communication. The various methods of atrial communication creations are balloon atrial septostomy, Z5 balloon septostomy, which is over the wire balloon, static balloon dilatation, which means putting a balloon across and putting a balloon, broken bro septoplasty, that means there is no atrial communication at all. You go and puncture the septum and then dilate. Blade atrial septostomy, where you cut with the blade, and last is atrial septum stenting. The Vashkin's balloon atrial septostomy works best in neonatal TGA. 
it works does not work so well in grown up patients and in non tga situations static balloon septoplasty is useful in tgas with older children where the septal flaps have become very thickened zephyr septoplasty is yeah over the wire septoplasty so you pass a 0.018 stick wire into the pulmonary vein and then pass a balloon 13 mm balloon is pulled back from the la to ra to create a tear between the atrial septum broken bro septoplasty is doing a septal puncture followed by septal stenting park blade septostomy is a blade septostomy you open out a blade blades are available at various lengths 5 mm 10 mm and 15 mm and these blades are pulled back from the la to ra where they tearing the atrial septum there is a risk of cardiac wall trauma so it should be done by experienced persons why atrial septal stenting in comparison to all the previous methods in all the previous methods nothing artificial is kept in the atrium you do a balloon septostomy pull out the balloon take out the balloon so have, there is no artificial material in the atrial septum the reason why atrial septal stenting is preferred is because we have a predictable orifice diameter we can titrate according to the need balloon septostomy you don't know what is the balloon size that you what is the tear size that you create in some children it may be 3 mm some children it may be 25 mm so you don't know what art you are creating so this is a predictable orifice diameter the only method that works in very thick septum all the previous methods that i told does not work in thick septum longevity of the palliation is the maximum we don't close at all so the chances of it remaining open is the highest with the atrial septal stenting and it is the best and reliable best and reliable strategy in condition where pulmonary venous hypertension is extremely deleterious for example a hypoplastic left heart syndrome you do a balloon septostomy and the septostomy tear closes up in 15 days time the patient will develop again a recurrence of pulmonary venous hypertension and that will be very detrimental for the child so you should have a very reliable a yeah, trustable method and that is atrial septal stenting now comes to what are the methods of doing the stenting there is something called as a routine technique there is another technique called partial unsheathing technique and third is diagonal stent technique i'll go into all the things what is routine technique first you do the septal puncture after going into the left atrium in patients with small atria as you are this is a newborn baby okay so this is as you are going across into the left atrium you don't have too much of space there so the moment you cross immediately advance a 0.014 wire into the left atrium and make multiple loops so this will protect the needle from going and poking through the walls of the left atrium and then advance the recovery sheet this is what is called as a routine technique so you do a transeptal puncture after the transeptal puncture put in the guide wire into the left atrium and put a stent across this is taken through a sheet this is an example this is a patient with who is 1 year old univentricular heart with severe mitral stenosis severe pulmonary venous hypertension and pulmonary arterial hypertension with saturation of 60% you don't know how much of operability will be there so first you do the septal stenting and after the septal stenting after you relieve the left atrial pressure then look at what is the qp by qs and if the qp by qs is substantially large and the pvr is acceptable then go for pulmonary artery banding in some children it is very common to perforate the left atrial root with the broken bro nail you can even see that there is a small amount of contrast that is flowing in this pericardial cavity but only a needle prick is there in the left atrium nothing will happen you just continue to do the stenting procedure as long as you don't push the dilator through the heart the needle punctures of the atrial septum will be pretty safe there are times at which an intracardiac adrenaline is being given and the child will be brought back to life the patient will not develop a cardiac tamponade due to your injection that has passed through the ventricular wall or atrial wall with the adrenaline into the heart so needle prick in heart is permissible it won't cause death whereas dilator sheath and all if you put it that will produce problem sheet is then progressively peeled back so this is the sheet now this is in the left atrium so 50% is peeled back then you 100% is peeled back so this is the whole of the atrial stem that has been exposed across then 
you open it out, you can appreciate that initially the proximal portion dilates, then the distal portion dilates, this is the base, this is the region of the atrial septum. And finally, you deploy it to the level what you want. And fine, so this is what is called as a routine technique. This can even be done in as small a baby. This is a hypoplastic left heart syndrome baby, day eight, very restrictive PFO, severe pulmonary hypertension. Saturation is only 40%. So we are crossing the tiny PFO and then putting in a stent. You can see this is the left atrium, this is the right atrium. The whole stent is deployed. And now this is the final deployment angiography. So these are routine techniques. The basic rule of this method is you have to measure the gap between the middle of the right atrium and middle of the left atrium. That will be the length of the stent. And the stent diameter will depend on what is the age of the patient and what is the indication for the procedure. You need to understand how much of cardiac output will go through the atrial septum. Imagine a condition like hypoplastic left heart syndrome. 100% of the cardiac output has to flow through the intraatrial septum. Imagine TAPVC or tricuspid atresia with a restrictive PFO. 100% of the cardiac output has to cross. So in those patients, you may have to need, you will have to put in a very large stent. For example, in severe mitral stenosis, you want to decompress the left atrium, but you don't want the entire left atrial blood to come into the right atrium. So you may have to use something like 50% of the cardiac output has to flow. In diastolic heart failure or in idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, where you want to decompress the left atrium or right atrium, you just want only about 10 to 20% of the cardiac output. So depending on your indication, how much of cardiac output has to pass through the atrial septum, you, gen, you decide on the size of the atrial septum, the stent diameter. And there should not be too much of manipulation of a stent balloon because there is not too much of anchor for an atrial septal stent. Second method is called partial unsheathing technique. This is a 30-year-old lady who had an ASD surgical closure with Dacron patch 12 years before and developed a severe pulmonary hypertension. Subsequently, progressive pulmonary hypertension, and now you want to recreate an atrial septal communication. So what you do is, you 50% of the stent, you open it out. See, if the sheet is being withdrawn, 50% of the stent is opened out. Then you open out the left atrial portion of the stent. So this is 50% of the stent being opened. Open out the left atrial portion of the stent. After the left atrial portion of the stent is deployed, then pull back the stent till you reach the atrial septum. You see here, this is being pulled up to the level of the atrial septum. So here you will be tugging against the atrial septum. So this is the atrial septum, and in that atrial septum, now you are tugging it. Once you have reached that level, peel back the sheath and deploy the remaining portion of the sheath stent also, and then slowly dilate the remaining portion. So this is called partial unsheathing technique. So this is the whole stent is taken within the sheath, 50% is exposed out, deployed, pulled back up to the atrial septum and the remaining portion is deployed. This prevents embolization of the stent. The third one is called diabolo stent. Diabolo stent means, this an example is in the situs inversus dextrocardia transposition where the LA was very, very tense due to hypoplasia of the mitral valve and we want to create an intracirculatory mixing. So what we are trying to do is we put in the catheter from the RA into the LA and this is, this is basically what is called diabolo stent. You see, this is the uh, balloon, and you either you put a pacing wire or a snare, and you open it out. You see here now, we are opening out the balloon, and the pacing wire or the snare is going to prevent the central portion from getting dilated. So once we have reached this, now collapse the balloon and put the stent over this balloon. So the first, the outermost will be the stent. Within the stent will be the spacing wire. And within the spacing wire will be this balloon. The entire crimp assembly is now taken into the heart. You can either use the O14 coronary wire to make all these knots, or you can use uh, epicardial pace, pacing wires to make these knots. Or the most simple thing will be taking a snare. So this is a snare. A snare can be taken. So once you have done this, the, the, the way in which it's going to be done, you have crossed from the RA into the LA, you have deployed 50% of the stent, you can appreciate here that there is a suture. So this is the, this is the stent, the suture is there inside, and now you 
deploy 50% and after deploying and expanding it 50% full back so this is this is the suture you see here this is the suture and the balloon will only get deployed up to the base that is created by the suture so this will, is not going to enlarge further so this is now the balloon is deflated you can see that suture is coming out the whole balloon suture everything is taken out the problem about this is you need multiple hardware like snare pacing wire coronary floppy wire all these things and but but this is a very elegant method you see finally exactly the stent will be put in the place where you want and there is no chance of embolization at all it will be beautiful to see such stents after the echocardiography see this echocardiography this is the left atrium right atrium the stent will never get embolized because it is expanded on the right side expanded on the left side and so you can appreciate a lot of left atrium lining of flows so this fibroblastic mitral valve is no longer causing any mitral stenosis at all it's completely getting decompressed 3D echocardiographic guidance is optional, can be used, but it's not mandatory. So this is about atrial septal stenting. Now let us go on to another area called ductal stenting. Ductal stenting can be done in duct-dependent pulmonary circulation or duct-dependent aortic circulation. So let us now talk about duct-dependent pulmonary circulation. We need to understand the anatomy of the duct. I'll go into each one of these. The anatomy of the duct can be varying from usual type of PDA, which is just from the descending thoracic aorta arch junction and coming out like a normal duct. It can be like a vertical PDA. It can be like a tortuous PDA, a curve like this. It can be a contralateral PDA. That means you have a right aortic arch, left innominate artery, either from the left innominate artery or left subclavian artery, the PDA comes. Or you can have bilateral PDA. One PDA comes from the innominator subclavian one PDA comes from the underserface of the aorta. So these are various types of PDAs. So PDAs, if you if you if you write in your echocardiographic uh, diagnosis, tetralogy with pulmonary atresia, single ventricle with pulmonary atresia with PDA, and if you don't mention all these characteristics whether it is usual type, vertical type, tortuous type, contralateral type, bilateral type, where is the narrowing, what is the size, what is the length, that information is not going to be of use for an interventionist because interventionist needs all these details. So this is what is called anatomy of the duct. How will you assess this anatomy? Echocardiographic assessment. So this is the suprasternal view and you are able to see the tortuous PDA, yes, shaped PDA, going from the undersurface of the arch of the aorta. So you measure the length, you measure the diameter, you mention the torch density. So this is the second step, echocardiographic assessment. Third step, angiographic details. If it is a usual PDA, this PDA is better dealt with on lateral view. You will be able to identify the origin to insertion. So any usual PDA, vertical PDA, tortuous PDA, all these things are better delineated on a strict lateral view. You also sometimes will do another view because you need to know the pulmonary arteries also. An epicranial or a shallow LAO cranial will be very useful to identify size and arborization of the right and left pulmonary artery. So this is a, a an epicranial or LAO cranial projection, shallow LAO cranial you delineate the entire PA. The confluence of the pulmonary artery that is not at all narrow. So this is a good subset for ductal stenting. Confluence is tightly narrow. This is a poor subset for ductal stenting. Contralateral ducts, any of the contralateral ducts or non-confluent pulmonary arteries should be by anteroposterior projection. So this is a right aortic arch left innominate artery, left sided PDA from the innominate artery going into the right and left pulmonary artery. So this is in an AP projection. Similarly, this is bilateral non confluent pulmonary arteries with bilateral ductus. LPA is arising from the undersurface, RPA is arising from the innominate artery. Again, this is delineated by AP projection. Iotogram can be done either from venous root or from arterial root. So this is an arterial root catheter which is injecting 
and we are able to see the ductus. The ductus is arising from the undersurface of the aorta and it is a tortuous duct. The same can be delineated from a venous angiogram also. So this is the venous angiography and you can see the same tortuous duct. It is always people will tell by doing this venous angiogram you are avoiding an arterial puncture so that is very good. It definitely saves the femoral artery injury but it splints the tricuspid and aortic valves and causes hypotension and also second thing it needs multiple catheter exchanges. First you have to cross with some end hole catheter like multipurpose catheter or a right coronary artery and then put in an exchange wire then change over to pigtail or put in a guiding catheter. So if you want to delineate the ductal anatomy arterial route is a preferred approach. The next step will be hardware that is needed. What catheter, what sheet, what wire, what stent. Most of the time for crossing the PDA you need a cut pigtail catheter. I am talking about new ones. So a cut pigtail catheter. So the entire pigtail will be there. You cut it off so that you make it like a yeah, hockey stick and then you make the hockey stick face the ductal mouth because most of the ductus are vertical PDS and then once you have hooked it advance the guide wire slowly through the ductus so that it goes more and more into the pulmonary artery and as soon as the floppy portion of the pulmonary the guide wire crosses into the pulmonary artery this guide wire will straighten out. So after the guide wire straightens out, the guide wire that can be used is balanced middleweight guide wire, choice PT extra support height, any coronary guide wire can be used. All the CTO wires should not be used, wires that are more traumatic should not be used because they will dissect through the ductus. It is also advisable to have an additional buddy wire, whenever you are crossing with one wire, put another wire also along the parallel so that it actually helps. Guide wire straightens out many of these tortuous PDAs. You can appreciate here, it's a very, very tortuous PDA, but this entirely tortuous PDA has been made completely straightened by this guide wire. So, the straightening of the guide wire actually makes it easy for any of the stents to track. What stents? We, we have stainless steel stents, we have cobalt chromium stents. Cobalt chromium stents are slightly better for trackability. We have bare metal stents, we have drug eluting stents. It, it used to be a fear of using drug eluting stents in neonates because drug eluting stents may release drugs like serolimus, everolimus, zertralimus, paclitaxel, which may be toxic to neonates. However, a recent study done by Lee Benson in hospital for sick kids with serolimus monitoring of neonates have shown that. Even though the serolimus level goes up in these neonates, they are not causing a clinically recognizable toxicity and so they may be acceptable. Stent diameter, usually between 3.5 to 4 millimeter. If the newborn is less than 2.5 kilometer, then go for a 3.5 millimeter stent. If the, if the newborn is more than 2.5 kilogram, use a 4 mm stent. This logic is based on newborns getting 3.5 millimeter BT stent by the surgeons. Now, there is no point in putting smaller than 3.5. They will quickly be uh, overgrown and within about one month itself you will have severe cyanosis for the patient. Length of the stent should be sufficient to cover the entire ductal length. You should not leave behind any ductal portion unstented. The final size of the stent also depends on what is available on shelf. You can say that I want a 4 millimeter diameter stent which is 17 millimeter long but that stent may not be available. So then you may have to use either 2 cent 2 millimeter more or 2 millimeter less and you may have to come out of the situation because it also depends on what is available. Preparation of the patient. How do you prepare a patient before a ductal stent? You have to get an informed consent because always BT stent is a another alternative that is available. You need to discuss the alternatives with the parents with the surgeon and keep the OR as a standby. Prostaglandin should preferably be stopped 30 to 60 minutes before to avoid stent migration. But if it is feasible, the patient who is having 45% saturation, you try to stop the prostaglandin 30 to 60 minutes before, the patient will not be alive for you to do the ductal stenting. Pre-procedural aspirin up to 5 milligram per kilogram through the nasogastric tube. If you have time, it is a good strategy. 
arrange for about 100 ml of Paxil, anticipating a blood loss and keep it ready. Full heparinization, 100 units per kilogram, you give, and if the procedure is getting more than one hour, repeat it at least half of the dose. Anesthetists are intensivists, is mandatory. You need to keep things ready for intubation and mechanical ventilation, but it's, it's optional. You need not intubate routinely on the patients. Arterial route is preferred in most of the patients. Tricuspid and aortic valve splinting will happen if you are doing the transvenous catheter, transvenous stenting. Now about the procedural details. A stable guide wire position is extremely important, so you need to advance the guide wire sufficiently deeper. Then you cross with the stent. Use an inflation device to deploy the stent and don't use the hands because you need to know what is the diameter to which you are inflating. A 4 millimeter stent at around 18 atmospheres will reach about 4.3 millimeters. So you need to know exactly what is the final stent diameter that you have got. And you are to also have to ensure that there is a full opposition of the stent to the ductal walls. So any uncovered portion of the duct should also be stented. See here there is an example of a small portion of the iota being left. So an additional stent is being loaded and a second stent is being deployed. Contralateral ducts are very simple to wire and stent. This is a patient who is having a right aortic arch, left subclavian artery, a contralateral ductus. So this is a left aortic arch, right subclavian artery, a contralateral ductus. So these are getting stented. Non-confluent pulmonary artery, this is an example of a non-confluent pulmonary artery. The right-sided ductus is arising from the right innominate artery. Left-sided ductus is arising from the undersurface of the aorta. I'll freeze it when both are seen. So this is the right PDA, this is the left PDA. Each one of them you then grow. Because if you, if you want to do a neonatal shunt, this will involve putting in a tube graft between these two pulmonary arteries and then putting in a PT shunt, which is extremely morbid procedure. So a non compliant pulmonary artery is far better tackled by interventionists rather than by this person. Bilateral ductal stenting. This is a left aortic arch, left-sided duct being stented. This is the right-sided PDA right-sided duct being stented. So this is the left stent and this is the right stent. This is far more safer than doing a, 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 a neonatal VT shunt in a patient by creating an artificial confluence. Access other than the groin, people talk about axillary artery puncture and carotid artery cut down. It is a good strategy because many of the tortuous ductus may get a better course from the subclavian arteries, so you can puncture the axillary arteries. However, axillary artery procedure is a little bit more morbid than the femoral artery procedure. Any procedure that you have been doing repeatedly many, many times, you are far more comfortable and far more skilled in that particular procedure. If, if axillary artery puncture is the routine way in which we all get it right, all our patients throughout our lifetime, then axillary artery stenting is the best method of stenting. If you had been catheterizing 99 out of your 100 patients by femoral artery, you are far better to do that procedure through femoral artery than by axillary artery. So this is a transaxillary ductal stenting. So this is a, yeah, a axillary sheath which goes down, guide wire courses through the, uh, the, the ductus and the stent is being deployed. So, but it, it we, we, we need not be fixed with an idea that all the ductal stenting procedure is better than from axillary artery. Ultimately, it is the competence of the particular person in whatever be the access that that interventionist chooses. The so post-procedural management should be, you have to stop the oxygen because saturations <coughs> will quickly shoot up to 95, 96%. Heparin should be continued 20 units per kilogram per hour for 48 hours. Aspirin should be given. Clopidogrel should be given. Early oral feeding should be started because if you have long periods of fasting, these patients may have GI ulcerations. And pack cells if there is blood loss, sodium bicarbonate for acidosis. If there is hypotension or heart failure, then support with dopamine. One to two doses of IV prosomide may be needed. If there is a circular shunt, give sildenafil citrate and oxygen. What is a circular shunt? You have a patient for whom 
done a balloon pulmonary valvotomy, either in critical pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia intact ventricular septum. So we have relieved the RVOT obstruction and created a free pulmonary regurgitation. In that patient, since the right ventricle is non-compliant and hypoplastic, the anti-grade flow from the right atrium through the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery will not be adequate. And so you need an additional source of pulmonary blood flow. There are two ways in which it can be done. One is to put in a BT shunt and second is a ductal stenting. If you choose to do a ductal stenting, aortic blood through the ductal stent will enter the pulmonary artery. From the pulmonary artery, it has got two ways of going. One, it has to go through the lung parenchyma and return into the pulmonary vein. Second, it can pass through the regurgitant pulmonary valve into the right ventricle. And since that right ventricle is not compliant, and there is a free tricuspid regurgitation as well, the blood goes from the aorta into the PA through the ductal stent. And from the PA through the pulmonary regurgitation enters the RV. And from the RV through the tricuspid regurgitation enters the RA. And from the RA through the PFO goes into the LA. This desaturated blood now goes into the LV, ascending aorta, again comes through the ductal shunt back. So this is called circular shunt. A circular shunt is blood circulation without going through any capillary bed. Blood just goes through arteries, veins, cardiac chambers without going through any cap capillary network at all. And so if there is a circular shunt in that situation, if you give filled and a filled citrate, this is going to cause pulmonary vasodilatation and allow the pulmonary artery to flow more into the lungs rather than regurgitate back through the pulmonary valve. Similarly, oxygen will also do the same job. Duct dependent systemic circulation. We are coming to the end. This is used in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Basic aim of stage 1 Norwood procedure is you have a patient who is having a systemic right ventricle which is pumping into the pulmonary artery. From the pulmonary artery through the ductus, you feel the descending aorta and the ascending <coughs> aorta. Ascending aorta is hypoplastic and most of the time aortic valve is closed. So what are things you need? You don't want too much of blood to go into the lungs. So we need to limit the pulmonary blood flow. You want a lot of blood to go through the pulmonary artery into the descending aorta. So you want this ductus to be open. You want all the pulmonary venous return that is coming back to the left atrium not to be having a high left atrial pressures. So you want a decompressing septostomy. So a hybrid stage nor stage stage one narward is bilateral pulmonary artery banding to control the pulmonary blood flows, ductal stenting to widen the ductus, and balloon atrial septostomy to relieve the pulmonary venous attraction. So stage one narward is three steps bilateral PA banding, ductal stenting and atrial septostomy. How will you choose the stent? You can use either a balloon expandable stent or a self-expandable stent. The diameter should be 2 millimeter larger than the duct diameter. So if your duct diameter is already 5-6 millimeter, then you have to choose 2 millimeter more than that. So you need to stent the ductus as large as possible. In a normal term baby, it should be anywhere between 7 to 9 millimeter. Length of the stent, the stent should protrude 2 to 3 millimeter on either side so that none of the ductal tissue is left without stent. Select the ductal length and then add plus 4 to plus 6 millimeter. Balloon expandable stents have got some advantage of having good control like EV3 primer stent and self expanding stents may be used like EV3 proteins. The reason why I am specifying both these. These are open cell design stents. And so when they are open cell design, if you are getting a retrograde coaptation, you'll be able to puncture the femoral artery, go through the stent struts, and then dilate into the ascending aorta. So you'll, you'll be able to relieve the coaptation. The implementation of this procedure, first measure the ductal length and ductal diameter, and so choose the stent. The length of the stent should be longer than the ductus by 6 millimeter. Diameter of the stent should be more than the ductus by 2 mm. Ensure that there is no posterior shelf. If there is a posterior shelf, stent the ductus, puncture the femoral artery, and pass a balloon through the struts of the pulmonary artery, through the coaptation, and get it into the aortic arch and dilate it. If there is a restrictive PFO, get ready for a femoral venous axis 
and do a balloon atrial septostomy or an atrial septal stenting. So first take the patient to OR. Do the sternotomy under general anesthesia. Ventilate with 21% FiO2 because you don't want to ventilate with a higher FiO2. If you ventilate with a higher FiO2, it causes a fall in the pulmonary vascular resistance which leads to systemic hypotension. Also, higher FiO2 may produce ductal spasm. So ventilate with 21% FiO2. Hypoventilate the patient to allow the entitled carbon dioxide or PaCO2 to 45 to 50. Allow the PVR to be high. Dissect both the pulmonary arteries and loop the pulmonary artery. Cut a ring out of 3.5 mm EPTFE tube graft and put it on both the sides so that you have 3.5 mm diameter of RPA and LPF. Tie around both the branch pulmonary arteries. Once the branch pulmonary artery is banned there, all the main pulmonary artery blood will go through the ductus into the descending thoracic area. So the systemic pressures will shoot up by 20 millimeters of mercury and the saturation will drop to 85 to 90 percent. Because all along the right ventricular cardiac output was getting wasted in the pulmonary artery. The moment you get banned it, systemic pressures will shoot up. Once you have done that, move the patient into the cat lab. This is the sternal retractor and you, this is the you, you pass the sheet immediately distal to the pulmonary valve into the main pulmonary artery and you inject. And when you are injecting, you will realize that this is the, this is the main pulmonary artery, this is the large ductus. So this ductus, this is the retrograde aortic arch. So the blood goes from the large ductus and courses through this arch and courses down to the descending thoracic area. So once you have identified it, then you put a marker catheter and repeat an angiogram. So this is a marker catheter and when you are injecting, you will appreciate the, what is the ductal length and what is the ductal diameter. So this is the length of the ductus and this is the diameter of the ductus. While in dump dependent pulmonary circulation, I told that you should stop the prostaglandin 30 to 60 minutes before. If you stop prostaglandin in a dump dependent systemic circulation 30 minutes before, you will not have an alive patient. So you have to do the procedure on prostaglandin. So now this is the ductal length from this point to this point. Add 3 millimeter here, 3 millimeter here, that is the stent length. This is the ductal diameter. Add 2 millimeter more, that is the ductal stent diameter because you need to fill it. The next thing, next step will be put in the stent, position the stent, dilate the stent. And once the stent is deployed, then you check angiogram. So this is the check angiogram and now the entire ductus is being stent. And there is a retrograde filling of the descending thoracic iota also. So this is the retrograde filling of the descending thoracic, the, 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 I mean arch of the iota with the supply vein artery, phenomenate artery, you can see the, you can see the ascending iota as well. So this is how the procedure is done. Last step that you do, do a balloon septostomy and create a septal tear also. So this is what is called hypoplastic stage 1 Norwood hybrid. So the three <coughs> aims in transcathetic Norwood are Restrict the pulmonary blood flows, create unrestricted systemic blood flow, and relieve pulmonary venous hypertension. Three points to focus on echocardiography are what is the size of the duct, how long is it, and what is the dimension. How is the iota? Is there a posterior aortic shelf or not? How is the atrial septum? Does it need septostomy or does it need atrial septal stenting? How do you implement? Choose the stent, deploy with precision. Femoral artery access you will take if there is a posterior aortic shelf and do a balloon dilation on the operation. Femoral venous access you will take if there is a need for creating an atrial septostom. So to summarize, we have been seeing something like a masala. We saw aortic stent, we saw PA stent, we saw infratrial stent, we saw ductal stent, we saw various stents. So stenting is a very valuable intervention in iota, pulmonary artery, conduit, vena cava, venous baffle, ducts, various other cardiac structures. Knowledge, map cards, there are so many areas that can be stented within the heart and congenital artery. 
knowledge of various things, deployment techniques is very important because it will help you to be a good interventionist.